The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to the iSpring Solutions webinar series where every week we talk about e-learning trends, share iSpring tips and tricks and cover clients' cases. My name is Paulina, I am the community manager and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. And today we have a wonderful topic and this topic has actually been covered at the DevLearn conference in Las Vegas where we've been I think maybe three weeks ago and it's been covered by one of our clients and it's called how to engage students with branching scenarios and this will be an actual case study. And as a speaker presenter, I have invited this client, our one of our most loyal clients, Michael Sirentola. Hi Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Paulina. Thanks for having me on. Wonderful. So Mike is an integration manager at Knowledge One and is a great professional in his sphere and knows how to create great content. And he was so kind to do this presentation again in the form of a webinar for all of you guys who didn't have a chance to see it live in Las Vegas. So thank you very much, Mike, for doing that. And I also would like to mention that this webinar session has been recorded, so guys, you will definitely receive a link to replay sometime after the webinar. However, I'd like to encourage you to stay till the very end because it's an amazing opportunity to address your questions directly to Mike. And to do so, please submit them in the question box. You will find it on the right side of the GoToWebinar panel at the bottom. And I also have my other colleague, Sophia, from the technical support department helping us with all the questions coming in the chat during this session so guys please keep those questions coming you will definitely get a response and also at this point i would like to introduce my other colleague from customer success department julia stells and she will be more than happy to uh, introduce our something something really special i would say so julia at this point i'm passing the mic over to you thank you paulina so hey guys um thank you for joining us today this is julia with the iSpring Customer Success Department. I wanted to let you know that uh, starting next week, November 19th, we are running a Black Friday special for both the offering tool, iSpring Suite Full Service, and our learning management system, iSpring Learn. To take advantage of the offer, just send me your emails or phone numbers in the chat window and I will get back to you. And also if you have any questions related to the offer or queries regarding that, like the pricing options, I'll be here during the session to help you. You're welcome to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, I really appreciate this intro on the special offer. And at this point, we are ready to begin. So guys, I'm passing the mic over to Michael. Thank you, Paulina. Good afternoon, everyone. I am just going to share my screen. All right. So as Paulina mentioned, today's case study will focus on engaging students with branching scenarios. Um, thank you all for taking your lunch time to attend this webinar with me. So before I get started, I'll just do a quick little intro about myself. My name is Mike Sarantola. I am an integration manager at Knowledge One. I have had over 10 years in the learning e-learning industry. I started in the pharmaceutical area and now I'm more in academia. I have three cats and a dog, so I vacuum way too often. I've been inspired by clean eating and fitness and over the course of seven years lost 150 pounds. And I am also a video game nerd, so I've done my fair share of having my eyes glued to a screen. A uh, fun fact about me is, since I live up here in Montreal, I ask myself why every year, as it is currently 12 below freezing, and I'm looking for another trip to DevLearn where it's nice and warm. So, 
work for, Knowledge One. We are an affiliate of Concordia University in Montreal. So most of our business is helping teachers at the university take their in-class course material and transform it to an online. So we do have some commercial and custom training clients as well, but most of our business will be with Concordia University. So Knowledge One has been around for roughly 15 years, and you can see some random fun facts about us. We have been growing in the last few years. We're now a team of 80 people wearing multiple hats, speaking multiple languages, and made up of all different types of wonderful skills, skill sets that make us quite a unique bunch and lots of expertise. So for the learning objectives in this session, I will be discussing the concept of branching scenarios within e-learning, how to apply different styles of branching to your training, and we'll focus majorly on a case study that we've done uh, this year actually that applied branching scenarios to our first university level program. We'll also talk about some best practices to engage your audience using branching and towards the end, hopefully have enough time for some questions and answers. So for those of you who are new to the branching scenario industry, a good way I like to describe them to people is kind of like comparing e-learning to books. So most e-learning, and I would compare that to a book series. So for instance, Game of Thrones. You start in your first book, your first module, you progress throughout, and towards the end, you'll learn something, you'll be aware of something. But if you start on module five and then go back to module four, you know, you might be a little lost. So everyone always goes through the linear approach. What I refer to as branching scenarios, I guess I would compare to, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar, familiar with these, but the choose your own adventure books that we used to have. When, when I was younger, there were the goosebumps one. So I always personally felt uh, more engaged reading those because you know you make a decision for the protagonist of the story and you feel like you have some more involvement or authority in what you're looking at. So essentially, branching scenarios are similar to e-learning, but uh, let you branch out and let the learner take control of the material that is being pr presented. So branching scenarios are more interactive forms of learning. Uh, we start by introducing a complex situation to help place the learner into perspective if they're not familiar with the topic. And then the complex situation requires the learner to make a choice based on his opinion and all the facts that the learner has gathered. And then afterwards, the learner faces the consequence for each decision made. So one important thing about here is that you get to learn from consequences of failing something specifically. So for example, if you're studying to become a pilot, it's much easier on everyone for the pilot to attempt crash landing an airplane in this simulation where no one's lives are at stake. Imagine the stress and pressure if the pilot had to do it on a real plane with real passengers. So this is an example of the branching scenario that we'll be looking at created in iSpring. Essentially, what helps us in terms of production is that these are easy to develop, modify, and update in any future iterations of the course. It increases the engagement as learners get to relate to it and make their own decisions. And as I mentioned before, you get to learn through failure as you get to re-go through the branching and experience different people's perspectives and potentially open your mind to new views you might not have seen before. So once it's actually written, it takes less time to build than a regular animated lecture slide. So some people refer to branching scenarios as adaptive learning. 
And as you can see by this little schematic animating, there's no real one size fits all to training. Everyone is different and every learner has their own preferred method of working. With that in mind, there are some training that should be linear, such as health and safety and factory training, stuff like code of conduct. But most content will benefit from having some adaptive learning. So now that the intro of branching scenarios is out of the way, I would like to introduce you to the case study that we'll be looking at today for the course topic of theology and bioethics. So before we get into the details, here's what it was before. Although this isn't the same course, this was the same professor who taught Introduction to Theology and Bioethics, and as you see on your screen now, Introduction to Christian Ethics. So this course was made roughly uh, five to six years ago, and you can tell by the style of it that it's very uh, web-based 2.0. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse cursor, but there's a progress bar in the top right, which was your progress through a lesson, and it's very text-heavy, and a lot of reading. You had kind of your navigation on the top and on the left. You had some of your resources on top, but it was very uh, HTML based, not really interactive. We had a video once in a while to introduce a new topic, but majorly was just reading. So over the last few years, we've been uh, overhauling the way students are presented with a course. So um, when we kicked off this new course for theology and bioethics, we applied a new design that now is more in the modern era age. So instead of it being all HTML based, each course has its own site and each content. So when you go to the lessons page, we've started to chunk out all the lessons into smaller digestible components based on the topic of every week. As you can see from this course, it is a very uh, material heavy course and some very sensitive topics. So as you can see, there's reproductive technologies, end of life issues, stem cell research, uh, very controversial topics that uh, many people have very firm beliefs on. The way we have our lecture and our lesson content in this course, we had used iSpring. And as I mentioned, a big part of this course is linear training. You have to be approached with the theory of theology and bioethics, but we do try to make it interactive with pop-ups and click to reveals to have the student more engaged than usual. And we also supplement with some introductory videos as well and try to get more of the human aspect because we do understand that when you're a student and you're on a remote course from home, sometimes there's distractions in your house or you feel like you've invested all this money and you're just staring in front of a computer. So we try to loop in the professors more and give more of that human aspect to our online courses. So essentially, <clears throat> what we wanted to do for the branching scenario is kind of use it as a supplementary component after they go through all of the all of the end life stages throughout your week you'll be hit with a variety of facts and alternatives and suggestions, some comparisons of people who have been faced through this, and then you get to decide yourself how to approach something in this branching scenario. So let me just continue and focus on dialogue simulation. For those of you who are used to iSpring, and for those of you who've been using this in earlier versions of iSpring, it used to be called TalkMaster. And now it is being renamed to Dialog Simulator, but essentially still has the same functionality. So we decided to focus on the branching scenario for the end of life issues lesson. So we called this one, What Happened to Sophia? 
So the main ingredients we use to create this entire branching scenario is essentially just PowerPoint, a license of iSpring Suite, a script for the scenario to create, an image database, and if you want to do some advanced animations, we did use the help from Adobe Illustrator, part of the Creative Suite. So how exactly did we conceptualize this process? Well, once we received the requirements, uh, we then had to get everyone in a room for a little brainstorm and bounce some ideas off of each other. And then in the end, we came up with our plan of action. So it's, as I mentioned, it is a very heavy course with lots of subject matter that is very sensitive as well as opinionated. So everyone has their own opinions on these sensitive subject matters. And the goal of this course and the goal of the branching scenarios was to increase awareness in students about making moral decisions or maybe stopping to think and putting your own opinions out of the way and assess the other party's needs when you make a critical decision. So let's get started with the requirements. Some of the initial requirements we received from the professor was that we would have one ethical exercise per lesson, and we had 10 of them in all. The exercise are ungraded, so they didn't count to the student's final goal. And we wanted them to have unlimited attempts so the students could then try again and choose different branching. Uh, the requirement was also to encourage students to think outside of their usual perspectives. Nowadays, most, um, most students are around, I would say, between 19 and 21 when they first enter the university field here in Canada. So at that age, uh, our minds are definitely not as developed as adults, and some people don't necessarily think about other opinions or other people's perspectives. So this was a good way to assess uh, the before and after once a student went through the branching scenario. It had to be interactive. Everyone, every exercise, like I mentioned, was on a unique ethical issue. So although we used the same formula every lesson, we still needed to develop the content 10 times to appeal to each of the topics. So after we had all that assigned, we got in a room and did the brainstorm. So we just shot ideas at each other, you know, non-graded component. It has to be empathy training. Uh, in our own natural processes, it must not exceed five minutes of learning. You know, it, it, it must be engaging. We must contain some animation so it's not too static. It has to be more practical-based instead of the theory-based uh, the theory based version of the content in the beginning of the lesson. As I mentioned, unlimited attempts so students can view different options. Has to be well written to allow for the emotional side of it. And my most favorite aspect of a brainstorm is for those of you familiar with academia, there's little to no budget. So it's always a short timeline and limited resources and you just have to get the job done as, as quickly as possible. So. Afterwards, we started to figure out our implementation. So I did have a video here. Um, I recorded it myself. I wanted to play it for you all. Uh, how are we on time? We still have some time. It's under four minutes. I'm not sure if I should link here, and we'll share this link with you as well, so you can watch it at your own pace when the webinar is done. But just to give you a sense of what the animation was, let me upload the video. Thank you for watching that, and I hope that animation kind of set the scene for you to be aware of the facts before making a decision. So as I mentioned, we'll share the YouTube link with you 
as well, so you can watch this at your own pace. And we'll move on to how we created this. So the first step was to create a script template for the SME, or in our case, the professor, to populate. Um, as I mentioned, the most difficult part of this is to get a script that really works well. It has to be written well. And for us working for the university, we don't have subject matter experts on all of these topics. So we asked the teacher to write it out for us. She did a phenomenal job and what we provided her with was essentially a template. So there's a little bit of the intro here that you could read. And then you have the questions that they ask you and answering this will take you to which question. So that's what we used as a map for our integration team to then build this. So depending on what you reply, you'll get a different end result. So once the script was approved, it was pretty much ready to be handed over to my integration team to create everything. So the second step was to create the graphical style and the animations while we waited for the script to be written and approved by all of the parties, as well as the audio recording you just heard to. So as I mentioned, we basically used Adobe Illustrator and we have an image database of Shutterstock. For those of you who do not have an account at Shutterstock, I've placed some four links at the bottom of the screen, which contain free images that you can use in your presentations. And they help a lot, but depending on the topic, you may not find exactly what you're looking for, but there's plenty of stock to choose from. So here's a video. Um, there's no audio on it, but I'm just gonna play it for you. It is essentially how we manipulated all the assets in Illustrator and copied them over to PowerPoint. For those of you who aren't aware of this neat tip, you're able to get vectors, copy them into your PowerPoint file and turn them into, well, retain their vector. So you can scale them up to any size, you can change the color and transparency and manipulate them all you want without having to create a whole bunch of animated PNGs. So in this example, you can see that once you copy paste in PowerPoint, you could ungroup the picture and you'll see on the right in the pane that ungrouping them turns them into all separate shapes. And now they're called freeforms. So now you're able to select each one individually and change the color one by one and resize them. So this is super fast for us. Uh, we didn't always know about this in-house. So we were constantly making new Illustrator files, new PNGs and creating the shape itself inside of PowerPoint because silhouette people aren't always available for you to insert from clip art. Can I ask a really quick question? Sure. From Libby. So you say that you use Adobe Illustrator, but can't we do the same thing in iSpring? You definitely can do the same thing in iSpring. Well, Essentially, this is the PowerPoint screen with iSpring, and we're manipulating the shapes in there. Yes, PowerPoint's native shapes have vector capability, and you can change all the color, but drawing a person in PowerPoint would take a lot of time with their pen tool. So an easy way to save time on production was for us to find a set of characters as an AI file on Shutterstock, and put them all so the height is all assembled. And then from there, we just copy and pasted those inside of PowerPoint and edited them there. So if this was a Photoshop file, for example, it would be a, a JPEG or a PNG, and you wouldn't be able to manipulate the transparency or the colors in PowerPoint. So working with a more flat, iconic approach allows people without a design team to be able to do a lot more without knowing uh, all of the softwares or having a license. I see a question here about the Shutterstock images and if they were free. Unfortunately, 
the sh Shutterstock image re does require an a slide I listed Unsplash, Pixabay, Free Images, and Pexels, and you can search those for anything to use in your presentations if you do not have an account for Shutterstock. So, all right. So, this helped us in creating the animation with all the colors being in the same grays, whites, and reds. Those are the colors of our company logo. So all of the images we found clearly weren't all white, black, and red. So we edited their colors once they were imported into PowerPoint. So next, we wanted to create the interactive branching scenario using dialogue simulation. And I won't play this entire video, but I did record myself using the script we got and creating this. So the total time of this video is 3 minutes and 41 seconds, and that is how long it took for me to build this. So the amount of time it takes to create something using dialogue simulator is super simple as long as you have all your material ready. So if I can scroll a little bit more here, you can see that I'm essentially just copy pasting all the questions and all the responses into different scenes in this interaction editor. And once I copy and pasted all of that, you could essentially just start to drag links to each other. So you can see here now I am choosing which response and then I you keep going and you have all your endings and in the end in three minutes and 39 seconds you have the whole branching scenario ready for you this is why we decided internally we wanted to add that couple of four minutes of animation because we felt that this still might be a little bit static for the learner and if the learner was just presented with what would you do being the clinical ethicist you know you need some background you need to know you know what's going on if you just read about a patient chart file you might not be as attached being a learner having not seen that whole animation so we thought that since you know, it took literally four minutes to create the branching scenario. We save some time to then put that effort into the introductory animation to create more of a wow factor for the students. So the next step after when we had the script all ready and the audio recorded is that we created the animation in PowerPoint. So you can see that my slides 9 and 10 were the branching and end, and my slides 2 to 8 was the animation that I played for you earlier. You can see that all of my animations are done in PowerPoint and nothing was done externally. And I have automatic animations and on-click animations. So for those of you not too familiar with iSpring, setting up all these animations is to go inside manage narration from iSpring and that's where you can add your sound files or your video files for each slide. So you can see at the bottom that there's a WAV file for my slides. I'm zooming in there and you'll see these little yellow markers throughout the timeline. Essentially each yellow marker is one of your on-click commands in your PowerPoint animation. So how you link everything together in iSpring is to click the sync button and you essentially listen to the audio you imported yourself and then just in Montreal, she and her click had four more children. next animation when you would want to cue something. Two of her children died of cancer in their late 50s. Her husband also had cancer and passed away in his 80s. So you did that, once you do that on all your slides, you save and publish. And then of course, at the end, you do publish once and deploy it on all your devices. All right, so 
we did that um, roughly 10 times. And we can, for those of you interested, we can share the other ethical situations with you as well after the webinar. Some of the topics are more sensitive than others, so it all depends on how comfortable you are with some of the material. So we'll have a little chose what we chose with the restraints and the requirements that were imposed on us. Um, the best practices we have for creating, engaging learning in HTML5 is to always analyze all our content and ensure the SME approves everything prior to us starting in production to reduce the amount of work we, to reduce the amount of we work with changes. Also, it's important to know your target audience, the age, location, the demographic, and you have to keep that in mind when creating your learning. If we would have known that all the students taking this course were maybe uh, 45 years and older, we might have chosen more of a storytelling narrator. Uh, he, we might have chosen more photographic images. It all depends on your target audience. So once you know that, you design your overall template and vision you know, for the project, the colors, the font schemes, some basic page types. And we like to chunk and keep everything between under 10 minute bite-sized components for digestion of material and to be able to do stuff on the go. Let's say you're in the bus, you don't have a full hour, you can just do a one little quick branching scenario, get that in your mind and think on it and to do it afterwards. So then we integrate all our content into templates. We use proper optimization needed for the target audience. For example, recently we did a project where we went to go uh, speak, teach English as a second language to the less fortunate in Africa. And one of our biggest constraints so in that case, we had to package everything locally and hand out U um, USB flash drives for those people who didn't have internet so they could still learn the course and appreciate from it. We create engagement and interactivity, animation, videos, but it's important not to add interactivity and animation just for the sake of it. If you put them at the right key elements to enforce key topics, the engagement will be higher. And of course, quality assurance, always check your work. We live in an age now where there are so many different mobile devices and so many different browsers that a number of issues can affect your content. So it's always good to take a look in the browser before you finalize everything. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And some of our key benefits for choosing iSpring Suite 9 would definitely be for one, the competitive pricing. I have a team of 12 integrators, so licenses don't always come cheap. The user-friendly UI allows for easy understanding. Everyone basically has a base knowledge of PowerPoint, so the learning curve isn't that great. We have a great support team at iSpring that responds quickly and genuinely cares. A lot of the issues I've reported in the past have been solved, so I do appreciate the partnership we have with them. <clears throat> the biggest factor for us is the reduction of production times. For us internally, um, we like to storyboard all of our content in PowerPoint itself. Uh, most of our clients and our professors have Office, so it's not a problem to share that with them. Uh, the downside for our timelines is once the PowerPoint is approved, we have to then recreate everything from scratch. <clears throat> Granted, the new version of Storyline has improved its importing PowerPoint capabilities, but for us, it's super easy to, once the PowerPoint is approved, we essentially just add in our animations, our sounds, and we publish for HTML5. So iSpring also retains super visual quality across its devices and platforms. The source files are PowerPoint, so you can use them um, anywhere for supplementary material. Our professors do take the PowerPoints after and create some brochures or some PDFs of study guides. So there's an ability for that to make everything consistent and harmonious. 
iSpring is HTML5 and LMS compatible, and that has a possibility of exporting as a standalone, like I mentioned previously, where we brought it to Africa without any internet required. The versatility of new add-ons, so the dialog simulation is still fairly recent to iSpring. I started with iSpring Suite 6, and it wasn't available then, so this was a great new way for us to apply it to our learning to have different kinds of interactions and different kinds of animations. And as I mentioned, it's also good for collaboration since for sometimes when we send our storyboards to our professors, instead of it being in a PDF, they can just edit some of the text themselves, send it back to us, and then we can just republish it. So if I'm looking at the time here, we seem to have a few minutes for questions. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Floor to moderating them. Uh, sorry, you disappeared for a moment. Yes, I think we are ready for Q&A session. So guys, if you have any questions, this is the best time to submit them, and Michael will be happy to um, get back to you with the answer. And while you are sending your questions, I would like to mention one more time for those of you who have joined us a little bit later that um, I have today with us our customer success manager, Julia Stels, and I would like to also announce that we are going to have a Black Friday special offer next week. So if you guys are planning on purchasing either iSpring Suite or iSpring Learn LMS, please, set, please let us know in the chat box and Julia will get back to you with more details. So <clears throat> I just see a great question here from Christina Moon about if I can say anything about accessibility. So I was about to start typing a reply to everyone, but I'll just voice this one out loud. Working for a university, there are tons of accessibility requirements. Um, we have something here called ACSD timers, which is, uh, let's say when you do an exam for different handicaps for students, we offer different timers as well. In terms of accessibility, what we like to do in iSpring is have a transcript. So I'm not entirely sure if I had a version of it here. I think in my image, you can see that in the top right on. Essentially, all the note slides of a PowerPoint can turn into a transcript. So iSpring has a great functionality where you can encapsulate all your notes as a poppable transcript for your learners. Um, let me just open it on the screen. I don't have one in this version, but essentially the transcript opens up here and it shows a pop-up window for all the text for your notes. So that helps us greatly for people with auditory issues. Um, another good fact about iSpring versus, let's say, video learning is screen readers. So um, there are a lot of screen readers out there that you can hover over and it will text to speech what the object is. Um, iSpring is compatible with screen readers, so you can get a sense if you have some visual issues by what's happening by clicking and pointing. The bad case about video um, lectures is that screen readers that I've tested so far are not compatible with videos. So there is more of, an, more of a push for us to become more accessible, and that is just a very vague word as depending on the country or the province or the state you live in, there are different requirements for that. So in the end, we do feel that iSpring has a better accessibility rather than us having to make, just have the transcript already on each slide. And uh, the screen readers do have a great plus for that. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and I will jump to the next question from Todd. Are there pros and cons of importing the audio into PowerPoint as opposed to doing it in iSpring? The main issue I find for having 
wave files on the slide rather than in manage narration is and don't quote me on this because I haven't tested it with iSpring 9, but sometimes you would have scrubber issues related to uh, syncing the audio to the animation. iSpring's manage narration does a very good job of keeping everything in check if you need to have things appear at very specific times. Obviously, if you're just having uh, bulleted text appear on screen and it's not very important to have it timed, you can essentially have your WAV files on the slide, but we we do internally always like to use a managed narration. So if ever we need to change uh, the timing of something, like I sh uh, showed you in that video earlier, um, you could just go and uh, and this one. Yes, you can just go afterwards and realign one of the yellow markers yourself so you don't have to resync the whole slide if you're off by like roughly a second or something. So we do find that it helps uh, editing and maintenance of it. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And uh, the next question uh, from Richard is the PowerPoint and iSpring Suite, the only software you used to create the project? So aside from having Adobe Illustrator to open up the EPS files themselves, Yes, PowerPoint and iSpring was the only software we used. Um, I'm sure there are open source softwares for um, those of you who do not have an, a license of Illustrator, but essentially anything you could use to open up a vector file, which is EPS, and then copy paste it into Illustrator should work. Oh, I lied. The other software we used was Audacity to record the audio. <laughs> have you recorded it with iSpring? Have you tried recording it with iSpring? We have tried to record it with iSpring in the past. There is a little bit of a workaround when we want to maintain or add something to the file. So, mm -hmm. but you can essentially, it's grayed out in here, but uh, when you see the audio button here, you could either import a WAV file, or if you go to the button that says record audio, that's right next to sync. If you have a microphone plugged into your PC, you can definitely just record on the fly as you go. Awesome, thank you. And a question from Ian. What is the typical overall timeline from request of a project to completion? Are all 12 of your team members involved or do you use a smaller group? That is a great question. Um, in my older job in the pharmaceutical, I have a roughly 60 minute seat time. So that would be uh, maybe a three to four month project from start to end, from analysis to the signing of contracts to QA and all of that stuff. Um, when I came to the university field, I was flabbergasted by how heavy the courses are here. Um, if I can say that each week is over 60 minutes seat time in terms of iSpring lectures, some courses have anywhere from 10 to 13 lessons. So uh, typically we give ourselves nine months to do an entire university course from start to finish. But that also includes the assessments, the readings, and all of that extra stuff that I didn't speak about today. In terms of my team, we normally handle maybe 10 university courses at a time. So we essentially split the team up to handle a course one on another. There was one resource we used to create all 10 branching scenarios. And once all the scripts were ready, it took under 35 hours to do the intro animations and the branching of each. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, next question from Sue. Can you share the script template and process that you showed us? This is the most important thing to get right. Absolutely is the most important thing to get right. I can definitely share that with you all. I'm not entirely sure the easiest way to do it. Maybe I can share a Dropbox link with Paulina and she could disseminate it or... Sure. Not <laughs> I think we can um, figure that out after the webinar. Right? 
as well, so I can package that too and uh, have a little viewable ready for those interested. Okay, perfect. All right, um, I'm not sure what Earl was referring to, but uh, he's saying, so is this a separate product? I already have iSpring 9. Nope, essentially uh, Talkmaster or Dialog Simulator or whichever you would like to call it is available from the um, iSpring ribbon in PowerPoint. So if I just, uh, do you see it here? I just, so you see dialogue simulation is to the left of screen recording and essentially choosing that option on the blank slide will open up the editor that I showed earlier where you can create the actual scene. So as you can see, I click on dialogue simulation on a blank screen and then it opens up this new window inside of PowerPoint where you can then insert all of your stuff in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, the interaction manager. I'm sorry, Earl. The interaction manager, we didn't really cover that in this webinar. Uh, essentially, to the left of dialogue simulation is another button called interaction, where you can find a lot of pre-built templates created by iSpring already, like a, a procedural pyramid or a timeline or a labeled image and stuff like that. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. Um, and the next one, let's go to the next one from Sue. Uh, there are, mm -hmm. actually it's not a question. There are ways to convert EPS files to EMF files for PowerPoint without Adobe. Perfect. That would be a great way for anyone who cannot uh, obtain a license of Illustrator to do so. Yeah, if you could share, Sue, that would be wonderful. Because I'm not familiar with them, obviously. Um, I okay. see a question from Wastu that says, how I managed the file size. So that's a very good question because obviously if you have something over 60 minutes of seat time, the file size can be very intense and add up very quickly. So I mentioned earlier that we like to chunk our content into digestible chunks, uh, segments if you will. So that also helps the learner not getting overwhelmed with too much information at once, but it also helps us um, in terms of file size. We now live in an age where people have mobile phones all the time and not everyone has a lot of data. So a good way, and I can check here, since the branching scenario was its own component, the file size in the end was 36 megs. So that's really not bad for someone to load on their mobile phone plan and not have to go through 90 minutes of preloading to only see one specific section. Perfect. I definitely can show, oh, I see a question from Erin to show the final product. Um, I definitely can. So you do have we the have, intra, um, yeah, dialogue simulation. <laughs> yes, so we asked the question and before we had the introduction, um, before we had the introductory animation, there, there was the whole intro text taking up the space of the image. So we decided to create the intro, take all that text away, and then just start again with, if you were the clinical ethicist, what would you do? So depending on what you think, you're able to click. Uh, the image will swap based on your response and will ask you another question or maybe ask you to rethink what you just said. So this one was rather short because the professor didn't want to go too in depth. So it had two answers or two branching each. You can restart and then take another one. And essentially restart again. But there's no limit to how many branches you can go to. With the right script and the right scenario, you can have a branching scenario that lasts much longer and be just as effective. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks a lot. And there's a question from Jacqueline. When storyboarding in PowerPoint, what steps do you take to convert a simple PowerPoint slide to an iSpring-based functional slide? I have had to rebuild slides when making content interactive in iSpring. Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, when a pop-up or an additional information box. So on one slide, we might have three buttons. Can I, oh, let me just do something like this. So let's assume, for example, that these would have been pop-ups. And I would say, instead of this, I would say, select each one to learn more. When we would storyboard this before the professor approves it, we would duplicate these slides and hide them. And then what we style personally as a pop-up is we just make a usually a 50% black box to show that it's an overlay. And then we'll style another box on top with a whole bunch of text, a title, and a close button. So then you would essentially have three of these like that. In the storyboard, the professor or your SME will be able to see everything static without any buildups. And then once it goes to my integration team, we essentially just link one slide to the pop-ups. So then we hide those slides from the table of contents. So you don't see them when you click the previous and next button. But then when you land on this slide, you're able to just click and go to those pages. Mm hmm Awesome. And there is also another comment from Earl. It looks like uh, your branching is uh, using PowerPoint links rather than the iSpring quiz branching capability. Am I interpreting this correctly? Interpreting this correctly, Earl. Um, when I presented this in at DevLearn, I included two other ways to branch. So you can branch using PowerPoint slides themselves, as you saw me do right now. You can branch using Dialog Simulator, which opened up that window for all those different texts, which we saw for the um, branching scenario. But you could also branch using QuizMaker and using iSpring's Presentation Explorer. So depending on the content and depending on your personal style of animating, there are different ways that iSpring empowers you to create types of branching, whether you want to do it from your quiz. Uh, a good way of doing that, let's say, is we have a quiz about becoming an entrepreneur. And one of the quiz is an assessment of, are you actually ready to make this sacrifice in starting your own company? Depending on what you answer to those survey type questions, it'll link you to another question. So if you say, you know, are you prepared to not have a paycheck for the next two to five months of your life. If you say yes, it'll take you to a question that would say like, great, what about this? But if you say no, it'll take you to a different question that will say, hey, well, if you're not aware, starting your own business takes a lot of investment up front. And, you know, if you're a new mom or if you're, uh, if you just moved into a house or something like that, now might not be the best time to do it. So for the branching scenario that I showed you in this webinar, we decided to use the iSpring branching simulator. For most of our, we do do a mixture of PowerPoint branching, presentation explore branching, and quiz branching. It all depends on the course and the subject matter that we deal with. Thank you very much. And I just see that we are almost out of running out of time right now. So let's cover one more question and we'll be wrapping up at this point. Uh, there is one from uh, Javier. From the performance and user experience perspectives, when it comes to videos, is it better to embed them, for example, YouTube videos or use local video files? That is an excellent question. And one of the things I would ask myself would be the target audience. So there are some limitations with embedding a YouTube in iSpring. 
namely you can't animate it. So let's say we wanted it to fade in or do something. We don't have that control. It's either there or it's not. A workaround we did was to put, let's say, a white box on top of the video that fades out. But if you have a textured background, it doesn't work that well and whatnot. The advantage of linking from YouTube is that it doesn't add to your file size. A disadvantage would be that your file size would be heavier, but an advantage of having it embedded is that you would have more control. Also with iSpring, if you notice when you open up a presentation, there's a preloader that preloads all the content for you. If you've noticed with Storyline, the preloader is slide by slide. So assuming you have a lower bandwidth internet and you finally preloaded your iSpring and embedded videos on every slide, it might be a little bit frustrating to then load that as well, rather than maybe a longer preload in the beginning and then no more loading throughout. But you know, if you're in like a if you're in a more urban area rather than rural, internet speed might not be a problem. So it also depends. You know, some LMSs we work with have a file size limit, so that already imposes probably no videos in our powerpoints. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. So um, Alexander says, please tell Michael that if he's looking for a place to get warm, Costa Rica is the place for him. <laughs> oh, I smiled when I read that. I would love to. <laughs> yeah. And, and I did see a comment from someone that, that mentioned that I did go too fast. Um, I apologize. When I get a little nervous, I tend to speak fast, and sometimes I feel that going through the step-by-step -step process might be boring or less interesting for some attendees. So if there is uh, more of a demand to, let's say, go through a more hands-on session with how to animate or how to use the on-clicks, it's more PowerPoint related than iSpring, but I would be happy to work on something like that as well. Yeah, I definitely agree, yes. And Earl says that he'd like to see more hands-on session. Yeah, we will be definitely um, holding more of a work, I guess, uh, workshops type of webinars. And we've done uh, this previously with Sophia, by the way, who is helping us in the chat today. So yes, we will definitely do that. And at this point, I would like to remind you guys one more time, if you're planning on purchasing either iSpring Suite or iSpring Learn, next week would be the best way for you to do that at the greatest prices and if you are interested just uh, send us your email address or phone number our customer success manager julia stells will get back to you after the webinar and also i am inviting you to our next webinar next week oh, i'm sorry not next week because it's uh, thanksgiving but on november 28 we're going to have a cool session with Richard Goring, who is a PowerPoint guru, and you might have seen his PowerPoint 15 tricks in PowerPoint presentation earlier. So he did session at the DevLearn as well, and we'll be doing a webinar for you guys about effective microlearning in record time with PowerPoint and iSpring. And I'm sending the link to it right now. So hopefully you guys will be able to sign up for it and we will see you there. And I would like to thank all of you for coming today, for spending your time with us uh, during this wonderful hour. And I hope you guys found it very useful. I think you, Michael, did a wonderful job. Thanks for sharing some of your knowledge with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me again. And thanks to all of you for your warm thoughts and wishes on this cold day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I read that the Dubai is also waiting for you. <laughs> oh, yes. <yeah. laughs> That's another one. And I would like to thank our wonderful ladies, Sophia from Technical Support and also Julia from Customer Success Departments for helping us with all the questions coming in the chat today. Thank you very much, ladies. I really, really appreciate it. And yeah, I think at this point we are ready to wrap up. I will be definitely sharing uh, the link to the webinar as soon as I upload it to YouTube. And also we will think with Michael what's the best way to share the webinar resources with, with you guys. And as soon as we uh, come up with any ideas, I will be sending out a message to everyone who has joined us 
today. All right, hope everyone has a wonderful day and we'll see you at the next webinar. Bye bye, everyone. Bye, Michael. Bye, Sophia. Bye, Julia. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much.